Esther at the Ballroom. Written by Abby Ailes and published by Starfall Publications. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Esther Esther's tears traced silent lines down her cheeks, falling with a splatter on the disturbed earth that was her parents' freshly covered graves. A river of grief, longing and anger ebbed and flowed inside of her as she stared unblinkingly at their final resting place. She wanted to yell, wanted to sob, wanted to scream at the heavens for taking her family from her. A brief memory of a servant filled her mind. The woman had lost her child, and she had cried out with her grief. The sound of her pain had wrenched through the world so violently, it had shredded the hearts of everyone who could hear it. Esther had been sixteen at the time, and she hadn't been able to understand the woman's agony. She had sympathised with her, but was unable to fathom the ways in which a soul could break to cause that level of anguish. Now at two and twenty she understood. She was well aware that weeping and screaming the way her heart desired wouldn't be proper for a young woman of her station no matter how much peace it might bring her soul. So instead, she bottled that anger, loss and grief back inside her. Esther imagined it was a string of yarn that she could turn and spool within her chest, winding it tight and tucking it away neatly. When the messenger had arrived with the news of the carriage accident that had taken her parents' lives, she had been so filled with rage and despair. Her torment had torn through her so fiercely it had taken her typically pleasant demeanour and twisted it into something violent and ugly. Esther had wanted to lash out at everyone around her, had wanted to break the furniture scattered throughout the home, had wanted to do anything to help abate the storm that had formed within her, but she had done none of those things. Instead, she had nodded her head, allowed a few silent and solemn tears to fall and accepted that everything about her life was about to change. The fact that her father's laugh would never echo through the halls of their manor again, or that her mother's beautiful singing and piano playing would forever be silent, had made her sick to her stomach at the unfairness of it all. She hated the quiet halls those first few days, or at least she thought she had. When the hustle and bustle of the preparations took over the manor, she found she hated that even more. The cacophonous noise that came with preparing her family's funeral felt like a disgusting imitation of the sound that used to fill the halls, and it made Esther seethe. That seething and that rage had done nothing but build up for the last few days. Leading her to now, where she stood over her parents' graves, not knowing whether to curse the heavens or plead with them for mercy, a hand rested on Esther's shoulder, ripping her mind violently from her spiralling worry about the future to her abysmal present. She cast a wary glance around, following the hand to its owner. Her Aunt Dorothy stood just a few steps away, her black beady eyes regarding Esther with barely concealed contempt. Esther, Dorothy said in greeting, her voice cold and unfeeling. Esther had only met her Aunt Dorothy a handful of times, and the woman had always shown a casual disinterest toward her niece. She was only a couple years younger than Esther's father had been, but the two had not been close. When Esther's father would tell her stories of their childhood, he'd said that Dorothy had been cold and distant even then, her only genuine concern securing a beneficial marriage. She had gotten her wish, marrying the Earl of Surrey, who had an untimely passing just a few years ago. Dorothy produced a white handkerchief and handed it delicately to Esther, who dabbed at her cheeks at the errant tears that had continued to flow during her lament. A shiver ran through Esther as her aunt's cool and uncaring gaze roved over her, making her want to squirm. When she handed the delicate cloth back to Dorothy, the woman plucked it forcefully from Esther's hand and eyed it as if it were now tainted. There, no sense in crying and causing a fuss. Dorothy's monotone voice and uncaring manner as she tucked the handkerchief into the small purse she hid in the sleeve of her gown. What happened was terrible, yes. When my Edward passed, I thought I would pass out from the grief and tears I had shed, but it will not bring them back, so there really is no point. Dorothy glanced back toward the graves, allowing Esther a small moment to collect herself and not react poorly to her aunt's harsh words. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom, Aunt Dorothy, Esther clipped out, keeping her tone controlled. Dorothy did not turn to look at her, continuing on as if Esther had not spoken. Of course, you will come live with us now, 
seeing as how my dear brother left you with no one else. Esther ground her jaw against the jab, swallowing the retort that wanted to escape her. Instead, she inclined her head toward her aunt in an attempt at placation. Thank you for your generosity, Esther muttered, trying to keep any sarcasm or doubt from leaking into her voice. She knew that her father would tell her to remain positive, his eternal optimism always on full display for anyone within earshot. Jessup Elkins had been a large man, both in size and demeanour. You would usually hear him before he entered a room, and as she thought of what he'd say to her in that moment, another lump rose in Esther's throat and she had to swallow past it. Dorothy turned her dark eyes back toward Esther, gaze roving from head to toe before she pursed her lips. The moisture in the air had caused strands of Dorothy's dull, lifeless hair to come loose from where it had been pinned beneath her hat. It stuck to the sides of her fleshy face, drawing attention to her swollen, round features. There was no kindness in her eyes as she took in her niece, no warmth to be found anywhere within her, and it made shivers dance across Esther's skin. Esther racked her brain, trying to recall any story or explanation for her aunt's incessantly cruel demeanour, which seemed more pointed now than it had before. Dorothy had not remarried since being widowed, and she had poured all effort since then into securing a suitable match for her daughter Agnes. Everything that Esther could recall about her cousin was that she was aloof, seemingly unaffected by most of the comings and goings of the world around her. The only time Esther could recall Agnes showing any real passion was when she had been discussing her music lessons and her daydreams of securing a suitor. So she was sure she would not find an ally within her cousin. A despair that Esther wasn't aware she could feel bloomed within her, bringing with it the urge to spill the contents of her stomach upon the grass. Another bout of tears pricked at the corner of her eyes as she stared at her aunt, and Esther tried to blink past them, bidding them not to fall. But fall they did. Dorothy watched with barely concealed disdain, her callous gaze following the tracks of the tears, doing nothing to ease her niece's discomfort. I despaired as well when my Edward passed. Dorothy clutched at the brooch secured on her gown, toying with it absent-mindedly as she spoke. It tore me open, in fact. I thought I would pass out from the pain of losing him, thought I would die from the longing. Dorothy sighed dramatically, her dark eyes swimming as her thoughts turned to the past, and Esther didn't dare speak. She wondered if this was a moment that she could use to her benefit. Perhaps she would be able to bond with her aunt over their shared grief and the heartbreak they had both experienced. But if her father's stories and Esther's own brief interactions with her aunt had taught her anything, it was that her moods were often mercurial, turning with breakneck speed at a moment's notice, and she did not want to risk her aunt's potential wrath by interjecting too soon. But no matter how much it hurt, Dorothy continued, as she turned her gaze back to Esther, and it hardened once more. And no amount of crying or lament changed the fact that he was gone and I was alone. And your time would be better served packing your things for our travels. We leave first thing in the morning. Esther dipped her head in acknowledgement, a hushed, yes, Aunt Dorothy, falling from her lips. She fought against the urge to show her disappointment as she turned and walked toward the carriage that would lead her away from Sussex Cemetery and ultimately away from her parents. Esther could feel Dorothy's steely and unapproving gaze on her as she walked through the headstones that marked the graves of those long and newly deceased. There was a small urge inside of her to stop and glance at a few of them as she passed. She wanted to commit some of their names to memory, especially the ones that had withered with age. Esther felt as if reading their names and remembering them would help them live on in some manner, if only by their names echoing in a stranger's thoughts. She didn't stop, though, afraid that her aunt would chastise her if she did. Esther kept her gaze focused straight ahead and her steps sure and steady as she approached the carriage. She sent a brief prayer into the ether hoping that someone, some day, would do what she could not. That they would stop and read the names amongst the stones her parents included and commit them to memory, allowing them to not be forgotten for a moment longer. A footman pulled open the door of the carriage, offering her a hand to help her step up. As she arranged her stiff skirts and plopped onto the cushioned bench, Esther kept her gaze on the still open door. Dorothy had lingered for only a moment longer at the gravesite before following the path that Esther had taken. 
Esther watched as Dorothy attempted to step delicately across the rolling, grassy graves of the cemetery. But when she watched her aunt stumble on a bit of uneven ground, she had to avert her gaze to hide the grin that tugged at the corners of her lips. Her parents would have chastised her for that brief display of unkindness, but Esther also knew her father would have followed it up with a wink. The thought brought with it another wave of sadness, and she worked to keep her features impassive as Dorothy climbed into the carriage and took the seat opposite of her. As the carriage began its bumpy and uneven journey to the Sussex Manor House, Esther turned her gaze toward the window. As the moments passed, Dreed began to spool low in her belly. She wasn't sure how long it would be before she would be able to return to this place, and she tried with reckless abandon to commit every tree, every stone, every leaf that danced in the rain to memory. The ride was over far too soon, and when they turned on to the drive that would lead to her family's estate, Esther began taking deep, measured breaths. The carriage rolled to a stop in front of the only home she'd ever known, and as she crossed the gravel road that led to the stairs, she allowed herself to stare up at the extravagant house. She took in the grand architecture, remembering all the time she'd spent in the varying rooms that overlooked the front of the property. With a heavy heart, she steeled her spine and strode forward through the doors for what felt like the last time. The ride to her Aunt Dorothy's residence in Surrey the following day was a bumpy and tumultuous one. The rain had not let up since the morning before, and Esther was unable to separate herself from the feeling of melancholy that had gripped her as she stared out the window and watched the landscape pass her by. The time from Sussex to Surrey went by with a creep and crawl that only allowed her to withdraw even further into her grief and fury. Her Aunt Dorothy sat across from her in the carriage, Barely glancing or speaking to her through the duration of the ride, Esther was sure she had spied more than a few soured glances thrown her way from the corner of her vision. She knew she mustn't feed into it, forcing herself, instead, to take up what would have been her father's approach and focus on the positives, little though they may be. For starters, she would not be destitute. It had been a worry of hers the moment the accident had been announced, as a young, unmarried woman, she had had no claim to her family's titles or land. Had her aunt not stepped up to take Esther in as her ward, she would have had to hope on the kindness of another noble family. Her options would have been to act as a governess and help them with their children, or as a handmaiden for another high-born woman. Neither of those options appealed to her in the slightest. At least with her aunt Dorothy and her cousin Agnes, she would still have access to some type of family, and maybe with enough time they might develop some level of affection for one another. Unfortunately, that was where Esther's list ended. She had no hope that living with her aunt and cousin would afford her any luxuries or kindness, but she would have a roof over her head, and she would do everything she could to make the best out of it. Esther watched the terrain through the window, taking in the dismal landscape as they rode in utter silence. When the carriage finally turned off the main road and down the sweeping drive that would lead to the Surrey estate, Esther had to stave off a sigh of relief. They bounced and toddled through the covered pathway until it finally opened up to a sprawling, rolling landscape. The estate would be pretty once the sun was shining on it, and Esther added that to her list of positives, bringing the total up to two. A few servants exited the large front doors of the manor, walking down the grand stairs to the drive that curved in front of it, preparing for their lady's arrival. Amongst the people waiting for them, she spied a finely dressed young woman, her raven hair pinned with precision at the top of her head. Even at a distance, Esther could tell Agnes had grown into a beautiful woman since the last time she'd seen her. She glanced down at her own skirts, running a nervous hand over the black fabric of her morning gown to smooth the already pristine edges. The carriage rolled to a stop at the front of the house, and the door was pulled open a moment later by one of the servants. Dorothy rose from her seat without a word or a backward glance before exiting and approaching her daughter. Esther stole a moment for herself, using a deep breath to help steel her nerves before following Dorothy out into the open air. A parasol held by one of the few servants that had come to greet them was thrust over her head, blocking the rain that was still falling. Esther glanced around her, hearing the raindrops splatter against the cloth, and was struck by the feeling that the heavens were weeping just for her. Staring at the house that leered down at her, 
beautiful and yet wholly uninviting. She wondered if maybe God saw her heartbreak and was allowing the sky to shed a tear on her behalf. Even if the notion was ridiculous, it made her feel a little less alone, if only for a moment. Agnes rushed forward, a clearly forced smile plastered across her beautiful lips and bringing Esther out of her morose thoughts. She had only a split second to take in her cousin's face before she was wrapped in her stiff, rigid arms. But that didn't stop Esther from noticing that despite her dark hair and fair features, Agnes shared the same black, indifferent eyes of her mother. My sincerest apologies, dear cousin, Agnes said in Esther's ear, and Esther was not surprised to find her voice absent of any warmth or true welcome. I wanted so badly to make the trip, but Mother said it wouldn't be proper. Do accept my condolences. It's quite all right, Esther replied softly before stepping out of Agnes's arms. Esther studied the other woman's face, finding not an ounce of sincerity despite the kind words she had spoken. That's enough, girls. Dorothy's monotone voice drawled from behind them. Esther, the servants will show you to your room. Agnes, come. Agnes and Dorothy did not spare Esther so much as a glance before turning away from her and beginning their ascent up the stairs. Their heads leaned toward each other as they whispered furiously together before disappearing into the house. Esther turned a confused gaze to the remaining people around her, not knowing who would be assisting her or who she should greet first. Miss, a quiet voice sounded behind her, and she turned to find another girl that appeared to be around Esther's age. I'll show you to your rooms. Oh, thank you, Esther answered, following the girl as she turned to approach the manor. She led her through hallways lined with paintings and portraits, rooms filled with stuffed chairs and bookcases, even passing an opulent ballroom. Farther and farther into the sprawling home they went, and with each step she took the more her heart sank. When they took a turn just before the kitchens, leading down a short, dim hallway, her suspicions were confirmed. The girl who had been leading her disappeared through an open doorway, and Esther quickly followed. It was small and drab, with a straw-stuffed bed in one corner and a writing desk. An armoire occupied the opposite wall, and the various pieces of furniture in the limited space made the room feel crowded. It was just far enough away from the servants' chambers to not be a complete insult, but disconnected enough from the primary living and sleeping quarters that her place in this family and this home was made completely clear. The servant turned and gave a slight bow before she made her retreat, leaving Esther alone in the claustrophobic space. She blinked her eyes wearily, taking in the bleak furnishings and the unwelcome aura of everything around her. Overwhelmed, she stalked forward and shut the door the servant girl had just exited. A heavy weight descended upon Esther's shoulders, making her steps lethargic and dragging as she made her way to the bed. Her black skirts swished around her ankles and tangled her legs as she crawled onto the mattress. The straw shifting underneath her and the creak of the old wooden bed frame were the only sounds to reach her ears. The pillow was scratchy and stiff against her cheeks, but the hollowness in her soul weighed her down enough that she still melted into it all. Her tears began to fall, unbidden and wild. They traced lines from her eyes to the pillow in hurried, uncaring streaks. With a fist pressed to her mouth, she bit back against the sobs that threatened to spill out of her, adamant that her grief should remain silent. A dam broke within her, and as Esther was carried away on the tidal wave of her emotions, she was forced to mourn not only the loss of her family, but the loss of her very life as she had known it. Chapter 2 Eleven months later, Lawrence. A rush of nerves flowed through Lawrence as he rubbed his palms along the fabric of his breeches and stepped out of the hackney cab and down into the gravel. He'd arrived at Surrey Manor only a few moments prior and he allowed himself a moment to inhale deeply to calm his anxiousness. Looking around him, he took in the grounds that surrounded the extravagant building. They weren't as grand as he remembered, the flower beds and gardens having seen better days, but perhaps that was just the rose-coloured glasses of youth tinting his memories. Lawrence turned and reached back into the carriage, grabbing the bouquet of fresh flowers from the seat where he had left them. He had persuaded his valet, Charles, to stop at one of the small shops in Surrey as they'd passed through. When he'd walked in and saw an entire wall of beautiful blooms and tantalising options, he'd begun to dismay. But the florist had come to his rescue, 
asking about the woman he was buying them for and expertly creating the perfect bouquet. It smelled heavenly, and he could only hope that Agnes would like it as much as he'd come to. At the mere thought of her, another bout of anxiety floods his system. He couldn't believe that in a few short moments he would see her again after all this time. Their fathers had been close friends prior to the Earl of Surrey's passing, and they had often summered together while their parents were away at court. They had played together as children, squealing through the halls of whichever manner they had been deposited in, causing Agnes's governess a fright. He'd fallen in love with her then, back when they were rosy-cheeked and ornery. In fact, Lawrence found it difficult to recall a time when he had not loved her. As they'd gotten older and seen each other less frequently, Agnes still plagued his thoughts and desires. She'd grown graver and more aloof in his presence, especially as the time between their visits lengthened and the pressure from her mother began to weigh upon her, but that never stopped him from dreaming of the day when he'd finish with his schooling and his travels and be able to finally attempt to court her. Now that the day had come, however, Lawrence was having an incredibly difficult time unravelling the knots that had formed in his belly. He shook his shoulders, trying to imagine the bundle of nerves coiling within him, rolling off his skin as he stalked across the gravel drive and up the elaborate staircase to the large door at the top. As he approached, something in the back of his mind noted the moulding surrounding the front door had small cracks running through it, and there was a bit of brick at the top of the stairs that had begun to crumble. But the thoughts were quickly chased from his mind as he raised his hand, grabbed a metal knocker affixed to the large wooden door in front of him, and gave it three swift, hard rasps. Lawrence waited patiently, listening tentatively for any sound coming from the other side of the door. He waited long enough that he began to wonder if he should knock again. Just as he was about to raise his hand once more, the door was yanked open with a flourish. He expected it to be a servant who had come to greet him, but was shocked when he found Countess Dorothy Jarvis standing in the threshold instead. He tried not to let his shock play across his face, working to affix his features in a kind open smile. Lady Jarvis, Lawrence said, sweeping into a low and gracious bow. Mr Bolton, Lady Dorothy's voice raised slightly in surprise. Her eyebrows dashed toward her hairline before she remembered herself and schooled her expression back into one of mild amusement. What a pleasure to see you. The pleasure is all mine, I assure you. Lawrence grinned at the woman again, hoping to charm her before asking after her daughter. Come in, please, Lady Dorothy stepped aside, waving a pudgy hand to welcome him through the threshold. Lawrence did as she indicated, stepping past her into the greeting hall. Now on the other side of the door, Lawrence could hear the sound of a pianoforte being played in a far-off room. Once again, he was struck by the lack of finery that had decorated the place in his memories. There were gaps on the walls where he could have sworn previously held grand paintings. The carpeting that swept up the stairs was fraying at the edges and there was sparsely any furniture or decoration to be seen in the wide open room. He pulled his gaze away from the furnishings, or lack thereof, and brought his attention back to Dorothy. She stood watching him, her black eyes not unkind but not wholly welcoming either. "'How have you been? Last I heard you were away at Cambridge,' Lady Dorothy asked him. "'I've been very well, thank you, and yes, university was quite the adventure.' He gave her a broad grin. Her eyes moved from his face down to the bouquet that he held in his hand. Lawrence could have sworn that the corner of her mouth twitched with the hint of a smile as she spied the delicate blooms. I assume you're here to call after Agnes. The woman gave him a knowing look, causing heat to rise in his cheeks. I was in Surrey on business and thought I would stop by to see an old family friend. Family friend, absolutely. Lady Dorothy's voice dripped in sarcasm. She's this way. She turned away from him, gesturing for Lawrence to follow, and began making her way deeper into the house. The longer they walked, the louder the sound of the music he had noticed earlier grew. Whoever was playing had quite a talent for it, their delicate and lilting notes drifting on the air throughout the manor. After a few moments of walking, Lady Dorothy turned into the family's music room. When they were children, he and Agnes had been strictly forbidden from that room, unless Agnes was attending one of her lessons, which of course meant they had snuck into it every chance they had gotten.
As Lawrence turned from the hallway and walked through the threshold, he once again was struck by how much the place had changed. But perhaps what had changed most of all was the woman sitting inside it. Agnes was perched on a chair, straight backed in a gown of his favorite, pale blue and delicately plucking at the keys of the pianoforte. Lawrence watched for a moment in awe of the woman before him, letting the gorgeous sounds that she produced drift to him in a fantastical melody. Lady Dorothy didn't comment on his observing her as she strode into the room and spoke loudly, getting Agnes's attention. The music stopped, and Agnes blinked rapidly before her eyes landed on him. Lawrence's heart jumped at her gaze, her dark eyes shining with something he couldn't place as she took him in from head to toe. Time had been kind to her. The roundness that had once filled her cheeks in her youth had now been transformed into proud, regal features. The raven hair that he had been so enamoured with in his younger years was pinned gracefully at the top of her head. As Agnes pushed herself up from the bench and crossed the room, he noticed the fit of her fine clothes and how they only served to enhance her beauty. Everything about Agnes Jarvis was art made in flesh. Agnes dropped into a curtsy when she reached him, and he watched as her lithe limbs moved. That's quite unnecessary, Lawrence advised with a smile, while also offering his own bow in return. Old friends need not preoccupy themselves with such formalities. She brought her gaze back to his as she stood, and she returned his grin. Lawrence couldn't help but notice that it did not entirely reach her eyes. As she studied him, he got the distinct feeling that while she was not bothered by his appearance at her home, she also was not entirely enthused with it either. With that notion, the balloon of hope that had been building within his chest since his arrival began to deflate. "'How nice it is to see you,' Agnes said. Her gaze dipped to the flowers he still cradled. "'Ah, yes. I saw these at the florist earlier and thought you might enjoy them,' Lawrence extended the bouquet to her. Agnes extended a delicate hand, plucking the vase from him and studying it. "'They're lovely, thank you.' Her tone was light and pleasant on the surface, but Lawrence did not miss the glance of longing she cast back to the bench she had just vacated. Not wanting to take her from something she so clearly enjoyed, he opened his mouth to tell her not to stop on his account when the sound of a bell being rang halted him. Lawrence glanced in the direction of the sound, spying Dorothy with a delicate bell held aloft in her round fingers. A girl appeared within the room a second later, bringing with her a tray of tea, biscuits and scones. Upon spying him, her mouth popped open in surprise before rearranging itself into a warm but confused smile. "'Lord Bolton,' Lady Dorothy drawled, gesturing at the girl. "'This is my niece, Esther Elkins. She is now living with us. Esther, this is Lord Lawrence Bolton, second son to Baron Ripon.' The girl Esther placed the tray on a small table in the centre of the seating area and curtsied to him. Lawrence greeted her in turn, taking in her fair appearance. Her hair was golden red, shining when struck by the light. Her pale features were delicate and soft, and her light grey eyes regarded him with cautious optimism. Her clothes were not as fine as those worn by Agnes or her mother, but he noted the colour of her dress was not far off from the one worn by Agnes, and they were pressed to perfection and well-maintained, and the soft blue complemented the pale grey of her eyes. A pleasure to meet you, Esther said, her voice like the tinkling of chimes. I'll be taking my tea in the drawing room, Lady Dorothy's voice interjected, cutting Lawrence off as he began to return Esther's kindness. Esther's eyes darted from Lawrence, an anxious look playing across her elegant features as they spied her aunt striding from the room. Esther bustled forward, her skirt swishing merrily around her ankles as she did. She began moving items from the tray to the table, leaving only enough on the silver platter for Dorothy's tea. Satisfied with how she had divvied up the treats, she turned on her heel and rushed out of the room without another word. He watched her as she went, struck by how odd it was that the Countess's niece would be serving them and taking on duties that would typically be performed by a maid. The sounds of soft music began drifting over the air once more, and Lawrence turned to find Agnes seated at the pianoforte, picking at the ivory keys, the flowers placed on the mantel beside the instrument. Not wanting to disturb her, he took a seat next to the small table Esther had arranged the food and tea on and began to relax. 
Lawrence closed his eyes as he listened to the music, drifting away on the lilting notes. Would you like a cup of tea? A high melodic voice asked, making Lawrence's eyes fly open with a start. Esther was standing before him, having stepped back into the room on silent feet. A soft laugh pulled itself from her as she spied his startled expression, and she brought a hand to her mouth to hide it. I apologise for scaring you, she said, her eyes sparkling with humour. I thought you had heard me approach. I didn't. I'm so sorry, Lawrence replied as he brought a hand to his chest, resting calmingly above his wildly beating heart. Esther gestured to the teapot resting on the table and raised an eyebrow in question. Oh, yes. Lawrence shook himself wearily, clearing the fog that had drifted into his brain as the music had filled it. Esther nodded at him, a small smile playing once more at the corner of her lips. She began pouring a cup of tea and asked if he'd like cream or sugar, which he declined both. She passed Lawrence the small cup of warm liquid and he took an appreciative sip. Please, help yourself to a biscuit or a scone. Esther continued, pointing to the serving plates she'd laid out on the table. She fussed over him for a moment more, and her flurry of movements began to make him a bit nervous. Please sit, he said, gesturing to the chair across from him. Her brow furrowed with worry for only a moment as she glanced from Lawrence to where Agnes sat, paying them no mind at all. She seemed to decide that there wouldn't be any harm in it before taking her seat. How do you know, Agnes? she asked as she arranged her plain skirts around her feet, crossing her ankles gracefully. My father was good friends with Earl Jarvis before his passing, Lawrence answered. We've been friends since we were children, when our parents were at balls or gone for parts of the season. We used to stay together and be watched by her governess. We were quite close in those days. Lawrence observed Esther as he spoke, noting her facial expressions as he explained the connection that he had with her cousin. As he recalled them being close, surprise flitted across her face before she rearranged it back into a mask of friendly interest. She hadn't been quick enough to evade his notice, however. You're surprised to hear that, Lawrence observed, raising an eyebrow at her. I just haven't seen you around before, that's all, Esther explained quickly, her words tumbling over one another. Were you and Agnes close when you were children as well? Lawrence asked her. No, she shook her head slightly. Well, there you have it. Esther's cheeks flushed slightly, and her eyes dipped to where her hands rested in her lap. She didn't speak for a moment, and Lawrence got the distinct impression that what he'd said had made her somehow uncomfortable. Not wanting them to sit in an awkward silence, he spoke again. Lady Dorothy mentioned that you are living with them now. May I inquire as to why? Esther's brow furrowed as she brought her eyes back to his face, studying him hesitantly. She let out a shaky breath before answering. My parents passed away almost a year ago in a carriage accident. Her words were so soft, he almost didn't hear it over the tinkling of the music Agnes was still playing. Lawrence's heart hammered in his chest, and he bashed himself internally for having been so dense in asking that personal of a question. Of course it was something tragic, you dunce, Lawrence thought. Most people don't go living with their aunts and cousins for no good reason. I am incredibly sorry for your loss, Lawrence said, keeping his voice low. You must miss them terribly. Thank you, Esther swallowed hard, and when she looked at him, she saw that her eyes were rimmed in silver. I do miss them every day. Esther's eyes left his, flitting anxiously to Agnes and then down to her tea. She was blinking rapidly, and he assumed she was trying to clear the tears that danced along her lashes. "'May I get you anything else?' she asked, gesturing to the plate of treats laid out before them, and it hit him anew how odd it was that she was serving them, and he hadn't yet seen a single maid or servant. "'No, thank you, but shouldn't a maid be handling all of this?' Lawrence quipped, speaking his thoughts aloud. "'I do this to show my gratitude.' Esther's voice left her in a rush, her tone rehearsed as if she'd prepared an answer to that very question. My Aunt Dorothy and Cousin Agnes have been so gracious and kind in taking me in after my parents passed, so I try to lessen the burden and be of use. A smile was plastered on Esther's fair face, and Lawrence regarded it for a moment, 
The statement itself seemed harmless enough, and it would make sense. But there was something about how swiftly the words had left her, and the way her smile didn't entirely reach her eyes, that made him think it wasn't the full story. How long has it been since you last saw Agnes? Esther asked, and Lawrence recognised it as an attempt to change the subject. It's been a few years now, at least. I've been away at university. Oh. Esther's eyebrows shot up. I'm sure you have loads of stories. Lawrence smiled at her and she smiled back. He was pleased to find it was a genuine one that time. He began by telling her of his time at Cambridge University, spinning tales of the men he met, the absurdities they got into, the ones that were appropriate, of course. Esther gasped and laughed as he spoke, her movements and tone animated as he recounted all the things he'd experienced. By the time they began discussing his subsequent travels throughout France and Spain, he wasn't able to stop himself from comparing the way Esther was reacting to how he imagined Agnes would in the same scenario. She had been pleasant enough when he'd arrived, but her demeanour and tone had been cool and withdrawn. It was nothing compared to the warmth and openness he was experiencing with Esther. Memories of their childhood flitted through his mind once more, and he wondered what it would take for him to get back to that reckless abandon. Would he ever be able to remind her that he was still the same person she had known all those years ago? If he did, would she open up to him once more? As his stories came to an end, they both paused taking sips of their tea. His had gone cold, and if Esther's wince was any indication, hers had as well. Have you attended a season in London before, or will this be your first? Lawrence asked, swallowing past the now cooled liquid. It will be my first, she explained. I was still in mourning last year when the season came about, so it wouldn't have been proper for me to attend. How do you feel about it? Esther glanced down at her lap, her slender fingers nervously fondling the texture of her skirts. A bit nervous, if I'm honest. Nervous? Lawrence's eyebrows shot up. Whatever for? Esther looked at him through her lashes, but she didn't answer right away. When she began speaking, her voice was low and unsure. It will be my first big event without my parents, and to think that it's the entire season, I will be completely alone, and the point of it all is to secure a good match. But what if I can't? Lawrence studied her, taking in the lines of worry that had formed at the sides of her mouth and across her brow. You won't be alone, he reassured her. Agnes will be there, and so will I. He could have sworn that at the mention of Agnes's name, her eyes dulled a little, and a look of worry flashed across her features. It disappeared as quickly as it arrived, though, so he couldn't be entirely sure. He could sense the doubt rolling off of her, so he continued. Plus, someone as fair as you. Every eligible suitor at court will be lining up to claim a line on your dance card. A faint blush rose in her cheeks, and she glanced away nervously. That was very kind, thank you. Her tone was hushed, and she seemed unable to bring her eyes to meet his. Before Lawrence could answer, the music coming from the pianoforte cut off, causing both he and Esther to divert their attention to Agnes. She had a curious look on her face. It didn't quite appear to be jealousy, but she definitely did not look pleased. A small tingle ran through Lawrence at the thought. Lawrence, Agnes said in her cool, aloof tone, I apologies, but Esther and I must get going. She smoothed down her skirts as she stood, shooting her cousin a pointed look. We have an appointment with the modiste. A bite of disappointment rushed through him, but he swallowed past it and rose to his feet as well. He inclined his head to the two women, wishing them well with their modiste appointment, and telling Esther it was a pleasure to meet her. They offered to escort him out of the manor, but he waved them off and said it wouldn't be necessary. He turned on his heel, striding from the room. As he situated himself back in the carriage, the wheels began rolling down the bumpy gravel pathway. Lawrence stared out the window, watching Surrey Manor shrink into the distance as he thought about everything that had happened during his visit. Before arriving, he had been filled with such hope. He had known that Agnes had changed over the years, that as time wore on, she had become more serious and aloof. He couldn't stave off the hope that the girl he once knew still remained within her depths. He felt sure that if he could just get her to relax in his presence, 
and find a way to reassure her that he was the same person she had known all those years ago, that it would be enough. The carriage rumbled along the uneven ground, bouncing him to and fro on the seat. As his body jostled, so did his mind, bouncing from thought to thought on how to win Agnes's affections. He was sure that it would not be an easy task, but feats of love rarely were. An idea began forming in the corner of his mind, and as it started to take shape, Lawrence could not stop the smile that pulled at his lips. Chapter 3 Lawrence The front of the building was exactly as Lawrence remembered it, brick, with trim around the windows and doors that had been painted with care. The large windows on the front of it jutted forward, and bodices were displayed within them, showcasing the incredible talents of the woman that resided within. He pushed open the door, a bell above it chiming out merrily with his arrival. One moment, one moment, a frail joyful voice rang out from somewhere in the back of the shop, the sound slightly muffled by the swatches of fabric. Sarah, Lawrence called, hoping that the woman would recognise his voice. He heard a faint is that, followed by ruffling, and then a form began to take shape through the forest of textiles. It seemed she had gotten smaller since he'd last seen her, but that happened as one aged. Her hair, once a shining blonde, was now almost entirely silver. But a wide, affectionate smile tugged up the corner of Sarah's lips, and her familiar blue eyes sparkled with joy, letting Lawrence know that some things, at least, had not changed. She spread her arms wide as she approached him, wrapping him in a warm embrace. Her frame was small, and his own body encompassed hers as he returned her hug, but that did not stop it from feeling comforting in a way he hadn't experienced in quite some time. She pulled back from him, taking his face in her hands and studying it. Her eyes roved back and forth over his features, as if committing them to memory and searching for any sign of change or injury. Lawrence, Sarah breathed. How have you been, dear boy? I don't know if I'm a boy any more, Lawrence chuckled, but I have been very well. Sarah released him stepping back to take in the rest of his appearance. He allowed her, understanding that this was her process. He'd gotten used to it long ago. Your breeches are too loose, she quipped, tugging slightly on the leg of his pant. Not by much. Whoever you went to for them did a fine job, just not as fine as I would have. I will remember that for the next time, he said, giving her a mirthful smile. It's been a long time since you've been at my shop. She pulled away from him, walking toward the door and locking it. That was her custom, wanting to be wholly present with whoever was with her. It was one of the things that made her so special. I was in school in Cambridge the last few years, as well as travelling every moment that I could, Lawrence explained, and Sarah lit up with interest. She began peppering him with questions about his education and travels, and he regaled her with tales of both. Granted, he did provide her with a condensed and redacted version of some of the wild antics he'd gotten into with his university companions. He did not think she would appreciate it as much as Esther had. So since you're here, should I assume that you have stopped by Surrey Manor? Sarah asked, cocking an eyebrow at him as his stories of his adventures began to dwindle. Lawrence let out a harsh breath, running a hand nervously through his hair. I did. He kept his reply short, suddenly feeling insecure about asking the woman for help. And? How did things go? Was the young Lady Jarvis there? She fought to keep her tone and expression neutral, but that didn't stop Lawrence from noting the glimmer in her eye when she asked. She was. Lawrence paused for a moment and Sarah regarded him. A rush of nervous energy coursed through him and he wondered how to continue forward. His thoughts began to spiral, wondering if he'd be able to do this on his own. Why did he need to bring in other people on his journey to love? How did that go? Sarah prompted, breaking through his whirring thoughts and bringing him back to the moment. Not well, Sarah, he said with a huff. When we were younger, she was so carefree and happy. But now, she is aloof, even cold. I do not mean that she was rude, no. She was perfectly polite and proper, but she seemed so withdrawn. I'd seen bits of that the last few times I saw her, but it appears the responsibility that has been placed upon her shoulders has turned her callous. Thank you and for watching. Feeling.
Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. And your feelings have not changed? Not at all. He shook his head and then looked at her with pleading eyes. I need your help, Sarah. I wish to woo her, to find some way to convince her that I'm still the same man she used to consider a friend. I just don't know how. She can be so mercurial and didn't really pay any mind to me at all. She greeted me, we shared a few pleasantries, and then she ignored me for the pianoforte while I spoke to her cousin. Ah, so you've met Esther as well, then? Lawrence nodded, and Sarah hmmed as she stood and thought. He didn't speak, prepared to afford her all the time she needed to help him in this endeavour to secure Agnes's affections. Lawrence watched her face as she thought, and he took note of the emotions that flitted across them. It started with confusion, but as the seconds passed, that began to fade and turn into something else entirely. The creases by her eyes started to soften, and the expression in the depths of her gaze took on a faraway quality. "'I believe I've told you about my John?' Sarah asked. Her voice was whimsical, filled with the promise of memory. He had never heard her sound like this. He nodded, indicating to her that she had mentioned her late husband in the past. "'I thought so. Did I ever tell you how we fell in love?' Sarah asked. Lawrence shook his head and Sarah paused again as if considering how to best tell the story. She walked to a nearby dress and began trailing her fingers absent-mindedly over the fine, rich fabric. We were very young when we met. My mother was also a modiste and she taught me everything she knew, she began, her voice hushed as she lost herself in the haze of her own memories. I spent so much of my childhood in her shop, I would pass the time by hiding between the bolts of fabric, hiding and playing and pretending that I was in some far-off world. I grew up there, and as I grew my mother began to teach me her craft as well. I believe I was fourteen, the first time John's mother came into the shop with him in tow. She needed a dress made, and he needed a jacket tailored. While my mother worked on the dress I was sent to work on John's waistcoat. His father was a wealthy merchant and John had travelled with him all over the world. That day, while he stood in front of me, and I measured him, working him over with my tape and my pins, he tried to impress me with stories of distant lands and riches. It was entertaining, but it didn't have his desired effect. While I liked hearing about lands that I would never see, I did not put much stock in the type of fanciful life that I would never live. You see, I already knew that I wanted to continue in my mother's footsteps. So, my life would never be one of the ones that he described. Sarah sighed, pressing a hand delicately to her chest, right over her heart before she continued. When he left that day, my mother joked with me about my flirting, and I figured I would likely never see him again. His jacket would be delivered to his home, and he would slowly fade into my memories as the handsome young man for whom I'd once created a waistcoat. But a few days later, a letter arrived that was addressed to me. It was quite a shock, as I'm sure you could imagine. And when I broke that wax seal and discovered it was from him... Sarah paused, looking at Lawrence with a small smile filled with all the love and warmth this recollection had stirred within her. So he called for you? Lawrence asked wanting to hear the rest of Sarah's story. Sarah shook her head. No, he didn't. Instead, he began by talking about me, about the things that he noticed when he met me and how he understood why I wouldn't be wooed by adventure or travel or even finery. So, instead, he would win my affection slowly by us getting to know each other exactly as we were. Just two young people, bearing their souls on parchment. And that's exactly what we did. We fell in love through our letters. He wrote me when he travelled with his father, wrote me when he was home before he finally came calling, and the rest is history. So, what exactly are you proposing? Lawrence asked. Letter writing? Yes, exactly that. Because when you write a letter, it's so much easier to be honest with the parchment than when the object of your desire is sitting right in front of you. You have much less to fear. You want to show her the truth of who you are? Want her to see that you are the man for her? Show her your soul. A grin pulled at the corners of Sarah's lips and Lawrence easily returned it. 
When he'd first arrived at the shop, he had been nervous that this wouldn't be the correct choice. But he could see now how foolish that notion had been. Lawrence thanked Sarah and stayed for a while to speak with her about her own life while he had been gone. When he had finally left her shop, the bell above the door jingling merrily as it shut behind him, Lawrence tilted back his head. He let the late afternoon sun touch his skin, feeling its warmth trickle out of him. He spoke to Charles before climbing back into the carriage, advising him of their change of plans. After all, he needed to ensure he had plenty of parchment on hand for what he had in store. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.